So I'm trying to play the other side. Sure. Okay. Well, I'm sticking up for those whiny babies. (laughs) Let's try to find (laughs) the no man's land then. This week on Backward Compatible, Jim, Doc, and Chris discuss the responsibilities of game developers to their consumers, and in what cases refunds might be justified. Plus, looks at Shadow Warrior 2, and an ASA investigation into No Man's Sky. The Backward Compatible.com podcast starts right now. Hello, Backward Compatible listeners, and welcome to episode number 80 of the Backward-Compatible.com podcast, games and new media with a splash of academia. As always, I'm Chris, and I'm joined today by Jim. Hey, guys. And we're joined by Doc. We're octogenarians! <laughs> and our media topic of discussion for today is going to be uh, the developer's responsibility to consumers. Uh, this is going to be touching on some of the issues that have been surrounding No Man's Sky. Um, we're going to be getting a little bit later into uh, how there's actually an investigation being filed against them right now um, regarding false advertising. Um, but we're going to be talking a little bit more generally as well about what expectations are consumers of games sort of entitled to have, what's the developer's responsibility to fulfill those promises, uh, If which promises can and can't be fulfilled, and when is that okay or not okay. Um, so I think it's going to be an interesting discussion. Me too, because i got to tell mm-hmm. you, gamers, they're entitled. <laughs> hey, in my day, grandma bought you a video game that she just saw on the shelf, and you liked it. That's right. That was it. You better not complain. It's so true. Or that's yeah. a paddling. <laughs> The paddling is uh, not, not really kosher these days. but uh, No, no, it's not. No, it's not. <laughs> uh, that's another topic entirely. <laughs> but before we do that, we're going to jump into some of our opening segments, including Wishlist. This is Wishlist, our most anticipated games that are either unreleased or we haven't had a chance to play. Next week, uh, there's a game that's coming out that I've been looking forward to for a while, Shadow Warrior 2. Uh, this is a game developed by Flying Wild Hog. And for those that may have missed the first one, uh, the first reboot, I should say, about three years ago, back in 2013, Flying Wild Hog released a reboot of Shadow Warrior. Shadow Warrior was uh, one of those uh, run-and-gun FPSs from the late 90s that took after Doom, Duke Nukem, um, that sort of thing where you were essentially running around killing demons and other sort of, like, monsters, and very over-the-top, um, madcap style. So, um, the phrase doom like comes to mind. Right. And this was really more took 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 after Duke Nuka more than Doom. The original was developed by 3D Realms, so that kind of makes some sense. And um, it was kind of a took that like sort of comical campy approach that Duke Nukem took. Oh yeah. That sure. sort of added to the FPS uh, genre as well. Um, Shadow Warrior, you play a um, you know, an Asian guy. His name is uh, Lo Wang. And, yeah, and this, they, of course, oh. play up the joke okay. many times throughout the game. Um, and he's fighting in inside Japan, inside modern-day Japan, but he fights, like, um, Oni, which is, like, Japanese demons of, of various sorts, um, ghosts, and then, of course, he actually fights ninja or other people with guns, that kind of thing. Um, he himself is a ninja. Um, the reboot, I actually played through all of it, and I don't know if y'all are aware of it. It was, it was, pretty, it was a pretty cool game, pretty fun. Um... They tried to put in some story elements, but the story elements themselves were basically just playing up the campy atmosphere of the story hmm. and just really let you just kind of go and have fun, and it didn't really didn't impact much aside from, like, a few laughs here and there. Um, the new one I am actually I actually think is going to be even better. Some of the things that they're adding that I'm most excited about in Shadow Warrior 2, um, so they're adding, they're adding a bunch of different ways to move through the, the environments. Um, you can climb walls. You can double jump, so it's going to be a little bit more ninja-like, I guess you could say, in your movement, which I think is cool. Um, The other thing is that they're going to throw in a little bit more uh, procedural generation, but they're just making the level for you. It's going to be to the point where enemies will spawn in different areas, um, and some of the way that, you know, the terrain is set up in buildings will be a little bit randomized, but for the most part, it's going to be taking after more of a... um, Think more the way that Diablo handles procedural generation. 
as opposed to like chunks of yeah, content. Sure. That's as opposed, the right way to do correct. That's generation. the right way, as opposed to say something like. Um, Don't say it. No Man's Sky. Don't say it. <laughs> Where it's it. just general procedural, like everything, that, no, not really any thought, no real craft. Too soon, Jim. Too soon. Yes. Um, In the episode, because we're talking about it later. Yes, exactly. <laughs> and uh, the other cool thing is that the game has a procedural damage system. What's that? So, well, apparently you can cut and blow off enemy limbs and body parts. Meaningfully? Yes. Because, I mean, that's been done before, but it wasn't meaningful. Well, this game is so... It's definitely focused on gore. Like, you're just similar to Doom. You're supposed to have fun killing demons. Right. So you're going to be... So instead of, like, with, uh, with Doom, you can kind of, you know, chainsaw through people, and mm-hmm. it's, you're not really in control of how you do that. It, at least the way that it has been described... Safety is important whenever right. you're using a chainsaw, Jim. Well, you have a sword as one, as one of your weapons in this game. You also, of course, have lots of guns, but you also have a katana. Um, you know, a Japanese sword. And you can use this sword to slice off limbs, supposedly. Interesting. So we'll see how, we'll see how that works. Now, how is it? Now, see, I would be really impressed if they actually mimicked some of the old uh, kung fu movies mm-hmm. where they were like, oh, you cut off my arm. Ah! And, you know, and he's bleeding out, but he runs away and that sort of thing. <laughs> I think that was in Monty Python. Not necessarily a kung oh, he, fu he, movie. He didn't run away, actually. <laughs> he, he, called, he called Arthur uh, Yellow Belly yes. for, uh, yeah, he, for he leaving. He failed to admit that he, <laughs> he was kept actually fighting. injured. Yeah, he kept fighting. <laughs> no, no, yeah, you're obviously ro- watching the wrong <laughs> kung fu movies. No, I, I, I do know what you're talking about. There are definitely some. Um, one of my favorites, um, one of my favorite films, Flying Guillotine, also known as uh, one, One-Armed... Um, one armed monk, I think it is, versus flying guillotine. Essentially, the main character has one arm, and uh, he has to fight with just one arm. Interesting. And in the pre- in the original version of that movie, um, you actually see him in a fight, lose his arm, and then keep fighting. Oh, cool. So, so yes, they do do that. Uh, one one armed swordsman is another mm-hmm. famous movie. Same deal. Well, I'm thinking about in more abstract sense, like you know, you, you take an arrow to the chest, and, and it actually. Uh, hurts him and, and, he, and he takes it and he, he curses you and he keeps fighting and for a little while and then he dies and that kind of thing. I mean, I don't know. I wonder. I'm, I'm it's com- almost comedic in, in yes. its injury. Not not just the comedic violence because that's a different thing. Right. But comedic injury. That could be interesting. I mean, I think that would certainly fit with the with the tone of the series. Um, oh, before we move off from this, I did also want to mention the four player co op mode because that's pretty different when we're talking about a run and gun FPS to yeah, have no a co op mode. So, um, and of course, online, four-player online co-op mode. Mm-hmm. And um, the interesting thing here is that because the game itself does have a little bit of a storyline with with uh, narrative to it, every character thinks of themselves as um, Lo Wang. You think you are Lo Wang, and mm-hmm. you see those character moments. And then if you see the other three characters that are playing, they just look like generic ninjas. Oh, so to your perspective, you are Lo Wang, and everyone else is just a ninja that's along, to, along for the ride to help yeah, you out. Yeah, but don't we all play video games that way? I mean, when you really think about it. Oh, yeah. I mean, you know, I am Geralt of Rivia. I don't know who you were when you were playing that game. That's, that's who I was. Well, I mean, because if you look at the world of Warcraft, apparently 99% of the uh, population is, uh, you know, these heroes. These with, grand heroes, yeah. which means no one is. And, yeah. and le- less than 1% of the population is the rest of the world. And the irony is that any NPC in town could still kick your butt. Oh, yeah. <laughs> Big time. Especially the guards. Yeah, no Stormwind kidding. guards, they'll just destroy you. Those guys are, oof. See, that's what happens. You hit level 80, you retire, you become a guard. Shadow Warrior 2, also, there are rumors that it's going to have an 80s neon cyberpunk um, tone okay, for a large part I wasn't of it. Sh- like sold until yeah. that you said that. You should have opened with <laughs> I that. Should, yeah, and I forgot. That, that's your opener. It was so. That's actually what got me excited initially, and I forgot to mention it when I mentioned all the other features, but um, it's been talked about among by some that have played a preview of it as almost like Blood Dragon 2, which is a game I really enjoyed. Okay. So, except the mechanics of, of Blood Dragon were not really that great, whereas the mechanics of Shad- the, the first Shadow Warrior were actually pretty strong. So I'm pretty excited to play it if that's what it ends up being. Yeah, no kidding. That sort of a tone, but with the mechanics of an actual good run-and-gun FPS. Mm-hmm. This is the Gaming Meta. News and commentary about the games industry and gamer culture. I did want to talk a little bit about Hello Games, and we had talked about this before. And for those that do not know, Hello Games is the developer... Uh, behind No Man's Sky. And Hello Kitty. And Hello Kitty. Well, no, actually, no, no, I can't. No, that's not correct. Uh, that, that is a much more... That's um, a slight on Hello Kitty that, that I'm not is. willing to make. That <laughs> Hello Kitty is too cool for that. Hello Kitty has been a successful uh, property for, what, like 30, 40 yeah. years now? No kidding. So let's... I'm not a fan, but let's not throw shade on Hello Kitty. Yeah, that no company's kidding. doing well, something right. We mentioned a while back, They're not actually, guilty of saying, false yeah. advertising. <laughs> <laughs> they're, they're collaborating with Sonic now, too, so it's, it's pertinent to gaming. That's true. Oh, yeah, that's true. Very true. Hello, Sonic. Um, so... We're just going to go over some of the recent news that has come out because 
I got to be honest. This is this is kind of shocking to me. I never really thought I was going to yeah. like the, like No Man's Sky, so I wasn't that interested. I'm with you on this, but I'm surprised by all the news that's come out. So, um, I did want to mention that there's rumors as of um, the past um, 14 hours or so. This this all started yesterday. This talk started about yesterday afternoon. Um, a bunch of posts started cropping up on forums, um, Reddit, NeoGAF, uh, Steam, that essentially show pictures of the Hello Games studio appearing to be closed. Abandoned. And abandoned. And uh, the pictures and the person that went through and was kind of investigating it um, is suggesting that it looks like it's been abandoned for a while. Do not trespass while playing, playing Pokemon Go, Jim. Mm-hmm. Well, I will say this. Other people, I'm, I'm going to just let that slide. Yeah. Um, other people have actually gone to the site, too, and have also posted the same sort of information, so it's not just coming from one person. Yeah. But, of course, this is the Internet. You never know. Yeah, this could be true. some sort of, um, and I would I would initially dismiss this and think this is just someone messing with us. Someone, other people are just playing along with a joke. It can't possibly mm-hmm. be real. If it were not for all the other news that is coming out of Hello Games. Well, yeah. Um, Another, or not coming out. Or not coming out. Another piece yeah, of information, shortly after the game launched, um, the community manager and the producer, uh, the producer also being Sony's uh, public relations liaison okay. to No Man's Sky, both of them left the, left the studio immediately after launch. Well, shortly after launch, I should say. Um, the community manager now works over at Eurogamer. Uh, the producer just went back to Sony. But they both left. And these are these are two people that were actually... Um, heavily involved in the the marketing aspect of yeah. the game, and he had some not nice things to say to mm-hmm. the the Sony uh, rep. Yes, um, so there there's some interesting information going on, and, and the the Sean Murray, um, uh, one of the developers of the game, has been strangely silent. People have been talking about this, like why hasn't he spoken out about some of the you know issues with the game, um, especially since we know that he's so very good at speaking out. Yeah. So there's a little, there's some like some questions that are going around, some rumors that maybe um, the company might have. As we all know, the, one of the biggest things is there were a lot of promises that went in with this game that were coming directly from the from the devs. Things like within the game, you it, it's actually a multiplayer experience. You're in this world with other people, and it's the world just happens to be so vast that you, that's why no one's actually ran into one another. It's just too big. Well, of course that's not true. That is a lie. That is completely not true. Mm-hmm. Um, and various other things. I mean, I as someone who has not played the game, has only seen some Let's Plays and experienced the game secondhand from other people, um, I can't speak to the game itself. It was never something that interested me per se, but I am disappointed, or at least I should say, I, I share the disappointment of those that were excited for it because it seems like this game really hasn't lived up to anyone's expectations. Mm. Um, Doc, you had some additional news as well. Yeah, um, well, there have been a number of rumors, and I, and I think rumors is the right word, about a class action lawsuit against mm-hmm. them for false advertising. And I think where this is coming from, and if I may, I've got a, yeah. an article where I first heard about this. This is from uh, Polygon. Um, no, Man's, no Man's Sky under investigation for false advertising. Um, no Man's Sky promotional material has come under fire since launch, and it's now the subject of an ongoing investigation. The UK-based Advertising Standards Authority, or ASA, confirmed to Polygon that it's received several complaints about No Man's Sky's advertising, which anger customers have criticized as misleading. Uh, I can confirm we have received several complaints about No Man's Sky advertising, and we have launched an investigation, the ASA told Polygon. Uh, a representative for the ASA declined to comment on the particulars of the investigation, but a thread on the No Man's Sky subreddit details some of the more prominent issues Steam, u- Steam users have with the game store page, which they passed on to the organization. Uh, screens and video on Steam suggest a different type of combat, unique buildings, uh, ship flying behavior, and creature sizes than what's found in the actual game itself. Mm. The store page overall has also been criticized for showing No Man's Sky with higher quality graphics than can be attained in game. Uh, the Reddit thread notes that the ASA is holding responsible both developer Hello Games and Valve, which runs the Steam platform, for No Man's Sky's controversial advertising. We've contacted both for more information and will update accordingly. On Steam, No Man's Sky has an overwhelmingly posit- or overwhelmingly, overwhelmingly negative user response. Ahead of launch, the game was touted as a sprawling, procedurally generated adventure through the galaxy. Players have found the finished product to be less than what they were expecting, with mixed reviews and an especially vocal player base calling out Hello Games for No Man's Sky's, quote, false promises. Yeah, that's just some pretty specific things. I know Reddit yeah. has, has gone into a lot of detail. I should say some Redditors have gone into a lot of detail 
to um, point out all of these ways in which the marketing has failed, or the mm-hmm. game itself, I should say, has failed to live up to marketing promises. Yeah, and the Steam community and continues also to do so. Actually, has been very vocal about it. Yeah, um, and and there have been a few others, a few you know key players, that sort of thing. But it's interesting because um, groups like PC Gamer and things like that, magazines, if you will, have mm-hmm. sort of picked up the story. The, the problem is there isn't a class action lawsuit to speak of. There is an investigation, but it's not a it's not an American investigation. It's a it's an investigation out of the UK, which could easily set a precedent. And there's lots of pre- other precedents as well. I mean, when we talk about you know like the key precedents of class action lawsuits, uh, GTA Five. Uh, comes to mind, the Wolfenstein, uh, the Dungeon Keeper mobile game, that sort of thing. And I mean, anything from like Aliens, Colonial Marines, to Kill Zone, Shadowfall, to the NVIDIA GTX 970 itself. Uh, there's been a lot of that kind of thing in the past. Mm. So uh, the I guess right now the, the good news of it all is that people are looking into it. Uh, nobody's rushing into anything, but you know, as far as the question, can they be sued? Well, of course they can. You can sue somebody because you don't like their hair, but it doesn't mean you're going to win. Mm-hmm. Uh, so, so really, what it comes down to is, um, is there a legitimate complaint? Well, yeah, of course there is. Is there a legitimate legal complaint? Mm-hmm. But that's what they're and so, that's the actionable, actionable, yeah. actionable, and complaint. that's the important distinction here. Where the ESA, what they're investigating is the contents of the store page that shows different stuff than what the game actually delivers you. It's not saying, oh, well, the developers said during development that this is going to be a thing and now it's not in the game. That's different from what they're actually investigating, well, which is the store page, which is advertising. The thing you see before you buy the game mm-hmm. has stuff that's inaccurate. But, but let's also be clear. It's not just what they said before the game was released. Mm-hmm. It's what they're saying after it's released. Mm-hmm. They're, they're not backing off and saying, oh, sorry, guys, we couldn't have uh, multiplayer in the game. We can't actually have you inside the same No, they're saying nothing. Mm. Uh, they're either saying nothing or there actually was one of the devs came out talking about how, oh, yes, um, we, can actually, we can actually see other people in the game now. Um, it just took so long because, mm. because of how big the game is. And that's actually not true. That's completely a false statement. And that, that was after the game was already released. Mm. And there's also the question, too, of to what extent can you call social media and or pre-launch game shows advertising? Um, well, that, that it, might get into some legal promoting, technicalities. Is it promoting your product? I would argue, I mean, I would, I'm would. i with you. I agree, then argue it is, that it then is. it is advertising. And, and mm. social media is, is used extensively now to, to yeah. for advertising purposes. Just mm. because you're not putting it, making a um, television commercial... Mm-hmm. Or you're you're or doing a like, ad like or a, a print ad, ad or something. Yeah. Mm-hmm. Social media is a, a means of advertising mm-hmm. and has been for some time. And if you go onto, for example, Twitter, you can find um, ads that are just that actually come up on your feed mm-hmm. unsolicited, directly Pro- promoted, and then, yeah. right? And then you also have um, accounts that are specifically set up mm-hmm. to promote their product. If you go onto say any any site like like say, say you follow um, Nintendo of America, hypothetically, mm-hmm. uh, which, which is a I company, do. right? A lot a lot of people do. Mm-hmm. Um, and if you follow Nintendo of America, you ha- you accept that a lot of what they tweet are promotions for their products. Mm-hmm. They are advertising their products to you. Mm-hmm. So so yes, social media certainly is involved in advertising. Mm-hmm. So There's PC Gamer, as I said, PC Gamer um, came out with a really great article on this. I would I would direct listeners to pcgamer.com slash nms dash lawyers. And, and really interesting discussion about the sort of the legal ramifications of this. But I'll, I'll quote this one part. It says, how many people bought NMS purely on the basis of it having flowing rivers? How many copies were sold on the ability to fly close to the ground? Mm-hmm. Was the promise of bathing wildlife a deciding factor for a significant chunk of the audience? Given how impractical it would be to prove any of these claims, it's highly unlikely the ASA will advise any sort of blanket refund or remuneration. So I think that as we move forward, and especially as we talk about our media topic, that's one of the questions that we we need to address is, uh, is the audience being a little too literal, demanding, and inflexible? Well, I don't or? think I don't think saying the word literal is, is correct. And I think at this point we're sort of transitioning into our meaty topic. And now, this week's meaty topic of discussion. If someone is directly telling you our product will have X, and you you accept that as true, that's not you being literal. That's you accepting what they're saying as truth. 
if they're telling you that's what the game is going to have, you expect it to have that mechanic. I mean, if just like I just when I in my wishlist segment, I talked about some of the um, some of the features of Shadow Warrior Two. These are features that are coming directly from the dev. If, mm-hmm. if the game does not have those features. Um, that's not on me. That's not my fault for believing them. That is their. They should not be telling me that that's the feature of of their game unless it is an actual feature of. And their so game. we agree that we should call shenanigans upon them yes. if they pull. Uh, even, let's just let's just make it a, an easy number. One key feature that we thought we were going to have, we ended up not having. Let's uh, let's just say that it was a, a good feature, but it didn't necessarily ruin the game. Does that mean that we are all entitled to a refund because the devs made the decision before release that they were going to pull that particular feature? It depends on how crucial that feature is to the game itself. And okay. I think an example that you mentioned before, Grand Theft Auto V, mm-hmm. um, there was a lot of talk initially where um, the expectation was online mode um, and heists in particular That's exactly what it was uh, were going to come out shortly after release. Mm-hmm. And they did eventually come out, by the way. Right. But it took probably another, like, what, four months or so? It was it was, it was was a chunk of time before it actually Wouldn't came know, out. Yeah. Um, however, GTA as a series has um, is known for its strong single-player um, campaign. Mm-hmm. The game itself really is not, has never really been a multiplayer game. And in fact... Um, a lot of people, a lot of the, the community, the GTA community, because I know because I'm a big part of that community, I'm a huge GTA fan, um, is actually pretty annoyed at um, Rockstar for consistently releasing new content for the online mode and not releasing new missions and new um, story content for the single player mode. Oh, I see. So there's, there's, they, they actually are con- continuing to release new content for GTA Online, and that's actually a source of, of animosity in the community. Now, they're not doing anything wrong by doing that, of course. Mm-hmm. They're free to release whatever they want. But my point is, GTA has always been a single player uh, experience. Right. They decided to have GTA Online, which I'm not necessarily knocking it. It's just not for me. But um, it's, a, it's a different situation because people bought GTA... GTA Five and originally for the single camp single uh, single player campaign with the expectation that oh we get this, the online campaign too we get heists in the online campaign too not I'm buying this game specifically for online especially since online wasn't released when the game first came out nor did anyone think it was going to be released when it first came out mm-hmm. that was very clear that it was going to be it was going to be as heist in particular it was going to be something coming after release so when you bought it you knew for a fact. It would not have that feature. It is not quite the same thing as something like No Man's Sky, where they are telling you we have this fish, these, this feature, this feature, that feature. The art's going to look like this. It's going to have, um, say, these sort of like um, uh, the running water that you mentioned before. It's also going to have people inside this world. You're going to be able to see other people in your world, but it's just a very vast world. Um, that was something that was supposed to be part of the game, but it's not part of the game. People bought bought the game expecting that to be something that. The moment they started playing the game, the moment they launched the game, those features were already present, but they were not. So I think it's a different, a different situation. Now, whether that's, whether that's right or wrong, I mean, that's, that's a different topic, but I do think it's very different from what GTA did. Mm-hmm. Well, you or know, GTA 5 did, I y- say. Y- you jokingly mentioned the idea of uh, when we were kids, you had a cartridge, you, you plugged it in, that was the game. Yeah. There was no update, there was no anything. And so when they shipped the game, that was the game that was shipped, mm-hmm. period. We live in a very, very different gaming world now. That's true. Um, there's, you know, there's launch day patches and stuff. And mm-hmm. so... A notorious example for that, which if I could bring up, because I know we're both Fallout fans. Yeah. I'm a huge fan of Fallout New Vegas. I thought that, that New Vegas was a, a huge step up from Fallout 3. Sure. Um, and not, not to get into that, but when Fallout New Vegas first released, um, I don't know if you had a launch copy of it, but I did. Uh, the game was extremely buggy and broken upon oh, yeah, release. I remember. Um, people were quite annoyed. Some people actually did get refunds, by the way, mm-hmm. for the game. They did offer some refunds, but um, within about a few days of, of uh, release, the community had already fixed most of the problems, and Bethesda did, or I think it was actually Obsidian, I'm sorry. Uh, Obsidian did actually fix uh, all the, you know, the bugs after about, I think it was a couple of weeks. I do remember that. So that all happened. So um, Unfortunately the, for me, I had a particular bug... That required me to um, to re- restart. Yes, a lot of people did. Yeah, and I just it, my heart wasn't in it, and I, I that second playthrough, I never beat that game. I I, I would re- strongly recommend you go back through it uh, when you have some time and you're interested in. I've always meant to. a post apocalyptic world. It's fun, <laughs> but uh, you know I still haven't finished four, so I, I sort of abandoned four. You can skip four. Just go back to New Vegas. You'll be fine. Oh right, okay. 
It's got Chandler Bing. That's true. Maybe Uncle Fer- uh, Fergus will like forgive me and, and <laughs> accept my phone calls again. There you go. Yeah. Well, I'd like to, to sort of contrast a little bit and to broaden the discussion a little bit. Um, you know, we're talking about No Man's Sky and some of like the, the false promises and that sort of thing. There's another interesting case we could look at, which we've you know talked a little bit before on the show. Um, and I remember it was a very big deal when it happened. Uh, Mass Effect 3. Right, um, right. When that came out and everybody was very disappointed in the ending, um, which personally I wasn't in that camp. I, I could, there were things about the ending I would have liked to see that I thought would have been better, but I d- wasn't like, it's like, oh man, the ending ruined the entire series for me. It, did, mm-hmm. it didn't do that it's at all. I mentioning that ending was a rewrite because uh, people got in there and, and like found the original ending and released it on the internet. Mm-hmm. That's the reason but, they rewrote that. But I think the but the reason the problem that people had with the Mass Effect three ending was not specific to the ending itself. It was the concept of that throughout the entire series you were making all of these choices that mm-hmm. were supposed to be meaningful. Yeah. And then at the very end, you don't actually have a choice. Here's how it's going to end. Well, and so, I, I think that was literally them punishing the community for call it one person's action of uh, oh look we had this great ending but now you guys get crap. Because you guys are jerks and you don't respect the. But, I really think but that, did, that's what. Came hold on, play. though. Did they have a great ending? Because what they had, the, unless the ending was based on your choices, it would end a certain way, and your choices have weight, and they will have weight at the end. That's the only way that would have been a great well, ending. They I never no had idea. that. They, I have no idea. But that's my point. They never had that. Well, they they had a static ending. That was the ending that they had, and so. And so you're saying that the, because they chose a different. Static ending. It didn't change unquote. anything. Yes. Well, they they had a color filter on it, depending on the choices you made. Right. Like I said, I mean, there, <laughs> were, there were a few other. <laughs> there, there would have been people but... that complaining, regardless, is my point, and they well, should yes. complain. They should complain. Now, I'm not. I'm actually not. Like I never really got into Mass Effect. I played the first one and thought it was all right. Um, I started to, to play the second one. And I really didn't like how they changed um, the game itself. It didn't really feel like an RPG anymore. Mm. Um, the first one was barely an RPG anyway. So I just gave up on the series, but. Um, I do understand that desire where it's like if when, I, when I play the Fallout games and I, I want to feel like the choices that I make have some sort of an impact. Mm-hmm. Um, so I can understand that feeling of, well, what the hell? This whole game is supposed to be about all these choices mm-hmm. I have. And the end kind of pulls the rug out from under you at the last moment. And, you know, my, my kind of take on it was I actually was very satisfied with Mass Effect 3. Uh, I know I'm in the minority on that, but... Um, I didn't see the ending sequence as just like the ending. I saw the entire third game as an ending to the conclusion to a trilogy that had been building up where I did see a lot of my choices actually have an impact and have, um, you know, you hear about the repercussions of things that you did in one and two. And then some of the things that you do in three do affect how things go for the rest of the game. Um, but then you get into this thing where, you know, if you if you don't like how the game ends or you don't like the ending because you think that, you know, one thing or another was promised by the developer, like they had this this vision of what they're going for and maybe didn't accomplish it. Um, I think that you're you're more than welcome to dislike the game because of it and to have complaints and like by all means if you feel like you need to review it badly, you know, all that different stuff. But there were people who were demanding refunds on Mass Effect three or because of the last or, or three expecting minutes. yeah, because of that or you know, demanding the developer like totally remake the last part of the game or whatever the case would be. I think that then you start to get into this territory of, you know, to what degree is the developer responsible to actually do something about it if you don't happen to like the game. I think the developer is responsible for producing um, a game, a good game. I Mm -hmm. mean, that's their responsibility. And if they do promise certain features, those features should be in the game. I do think there is is some legitimate concern there um, that if if the entire game itself is is built on this concept of making meaningful choices, Mm -hmm. and then those meaningful choices don't really matter at the end, um, can you really say the game delivered on that promise? Uh, you could make that argument mm. that it didn't. Now, again, I have not. I cannot say uh, that that I've played enough Mass Effect because I played all of one and part of two mm-hmm. to really say that I can comment on whether Mass Effect Three actually did that or not. But I do know some very passionate Mass Effect fans mm-hmm. who would who would say no, it didn't mm-hmm. because of that ending. Yeah, and I understand you disagree because there were other things before the ending mm-hmm. that you felt okay. Well, my choices in one and two have impacted the way that people interact with me in three. Mm-hmm. But I think that as a as a culture, we're so tied to storytelling, and a big part of a story is the ending, and this is what we remember at the That's end. That's true. We're, yeah. we're expecting things to be to come full circle and to reach a point, a, a, a conclusion point that is satisfying in some way, not necessarily. Happy, mm-hmm. of course, plenty of stories and, and poorly, yeah. but is satisfying in some way that we feel like the story itself was building up to this moment. Mm-hmm. And 
if if the point is for you to you to have agency in the story, um, and then at the very end, at that culminating moment, that agency is stripped away. Um, I think that that is does a disservice to the storytelling itself, and, and can leave a very sour taste in your mouth. Um, to compare it to another game that people insulted the ending over, which I actually kind of disagree with, um, Red Dead Redemption was one of my favorite games ever. Yeah, but there was um, there were some people that didn't like the ending. Because, I was disappointed in the ending, uh, mainly because of the idea that you, as John Marston, were unable to um, essentially like stop. The, uh, the bad guys from shooting you up. And That's right. You can step out and you can face them, but you can use your, um, I forget what it's called, your dead eye attack, I think it is, to try to take, to slow down time and try to take out as many of them as you can. But there's like 20 people shooting at you, so right. it's impossible. There is no um, it's method. It's scripted of, death. Yes, yes, it is. And there's no method of, um, I'm going to try to develop a strategy to take these people out. Instead, you just kind of like, and they did it on purpose, it's supposed to be this noble death. You nobly step out knowing that you're going to die for your family, that kind of thing. Um, and I've heard arguments from both sides where it's like, well, he could have, maybe there's a strategy he could have employed, so maybe you can try to take out as many of them as you can, maybe that you should have had a way to survive. I think because Red Dead Redemption itself, like all like the GTA games as well, and all of Rockstar game content, by the way, um, even though you have choice in what you can do in terms of how you approach the game, the stories are all are, are linear. The stories in in these games are linear. That's true. You have a little bit of choice in terms of like at the end of GTA V, you get to choose: do you do you want to um, which person do you want to betray and have killed, or do you want to have try to have all three of them live and go out and go after like the bad guy yourself altogether, which is the hardest ending to get. Um, it's the one most people pick, but. Um, so you have a little bit of choice in terms of the way the story goes. But for the most part, their, their stories are linear. So I think there's less of a reason for people to argue about it. But um, I do think that it, it does show that there are a passion for a lot of these games mm-hmm. and these characters where people do make these complaints. Yeah. And I guess kind of like my point there is, you know, and I, I would argue that, you know, for as much as Mass Effect did talk about being branching and having all this different stuff, you know, we understand as game developers, especially and as game academics, that it's really, really, really hard to have a truly like open ended branching narrative. Right. Um, but I, I don't you know, it's more it's more the, the the threaded cord than it is like a branching narrative. Yeah, well I agree with you to an extent. I mean I understand it's hard, but saying, Oh well, let's just excuse him because it's hard mm. that's a bogus argument. If you're gonna say that you're gonna do something, do it. If you can't, if you don't think you can do it because it's hard, then don't promise. I, I, know, I don't. That don't promise. Yeah, I don't. I don't think that's they, nonsense. I don't think they broke any promises, though. I think that they did like actually a really good job doing what they claimed they were trying. We to will do. agree to disagree because that, that's they, fair. They, they definitely but, did break but, their. But here, promise. herein lies they my did. point, though. We we have this disagreement about that, but I don't think that that right there did the, did the ending reflect the choices that you made throughout the game. The very yes ending, no? yes. The very ending. The answer to that question is no. But I just want to hear. I just want to hear you say. Okay. So no, no, no. And, just answer the question: okay. yes or no. Your your question: no. Okay then. But I would that's, argue that I'm, I understand what you were saying mm, about the rest of the game. Yeah. My point is that's why people were complaining. But I would about say that all the choices I made leading up to that did affect how I viewed the ending and but which of the three choices I that's made. That's true. That's a very good. But point. that's but that's Fire not what I, comes to mind. But that's not why people were complaining. Mm. They weren't. They didn't want. Oh, can I view it differently? Because mm. that's that's you. That's mm. you putting your own subjective view mm. on the ending itself. Well, but who said that that had to be that way? That's you. the developers. <clears throat> They said they were going to give... An diff- ending that, that changed based yes. upon... They yes. said that? Yes, they specifically, all throughout the entire game, were saying, your choices from number one are uh-huh. going to carry over into two and carry over into three, and you're going to have... And all of your choices will have ramifications that will that will eventually mean you will have a different experience throughout the game. And you did, they, and everything you just said is true. No, it's not, because of the ending. Everybody did have a... a you're, you're saying that, that... The ending is what... the end yes. cap itself the end, changed everything else yes. about your experience? Yes. The end, the ending, retroactively? The ending of a story is the most important, and yes, it does retroactively change. Uh, how many times have you watched a movie, you were enjoying it, you get to the ending, the ending is terrible, your entire experience of that movie has been ruined, because it's happened to me many times. Well, the opposite has also happened. Sure, of course. I, I agree with I you completely. To, I absolutely I agree with you completely. And that's why I ended Fight Club, Club the first time yeah. I saw it. Hated it. And then I got to the end of it and I went, holy cow. And it became one of my favorite yes. movies for decades. And that's what I'm, but see, that's the power of endings. And that's the point that I'm making is that the ending, not just, it doesn't just make or break the story, it is the story. But the ending had nothing to do with, and I'm talking again about Fight Club, but the, the ending didn't, it didn't match. It didn't match expectations. And that's for what Fight I'm Club? saying. Yeah. I mean, I, I would disagree with you on, on your. 
on what you're saying about what, Fight Club. What to be I, with you. I what thought I it was a good movie. What I expected to but. happen, what I expected to happen in Fight Club did not happen, and I was overjoyed that that was true. Mm. And so, in this case, one could say that as as artists, writers reserve the right to uh, creative license, and if at the end the story that they were trying to tell the entire time is it doesn't matter what you do, your it, your actions are futile because the universe is bigger than you are. Then that is the story they succeeded in telling, and that is the story that, that that is the story that they were telling in Red Dead Redemption. But the story, the story they were telling in that, and uh, no, but the difference Mass is, too. but the difference is a Mass Effect. The way they marketed it and the way they talked about the game from the very first game consistently throughout was the opposite. Was that you will have all these choices? That it is not that way. Find that was, me. That was find the me selling clip. point. Find that me was a clip that point. says, "And the ending will change depending on what you do." And I will switch my position. Find me a clip that says that, and I will switch my position. They probably do have that, but the point is that was the expectation. And I'm saying find that was the expectation. It, find, well, but that's a false and it expectation. Should be. It if should that be the wasn't expectation. Wasn't actually advertised that way. It's a false expectation. Ex- expectation. But it's not if your game is built on choice. If your game is built on narrative choice, then there's no reason why you shouldn't expect the ending to reflect. That. Now, are you talking an ending along the lines of, say, the Fallout endings? Yes, that's where, exactly where what I'm talking the, about. There's a series of basically clips that can either go A direction or B direction, and they're intercut in such a way that your own ending is unique to you. Yes, and a whole town dies because you never went there. Yes, but people, but <laughs> I completely yes, but people were expecting a little bit more than that because of because of how touted that feature was in Mass Effect. But, but yes, that is what I'm talking about. What is irrelevant unless they were expecting that it because was specifically advertised. It was specifically advertised as a general feature of the game. Now, did they specifically say the ending will do X, Y, Z? That I can't, I'm not sure. I, they, may, they very well may have, but that I'm not sure. But the point is when that, that is the overall feature that is touted for your game, then yes, there's no reason why. It's like... You're, it's, it's, it feels like you're kind of trying to lawyer it when you say, well, you know, even though that's the main feature, uh, we didn't well, specifically well, say that's what we're talking about. You, you, you say it lawyer, that, that's exactly what we're talking about, and this is where I was going no, no, with no, no, this but, thing. But it's different. As a legal precedent, Again, are they no, a no, 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 no. I'm not, I don't, uh, no, they're not a fault legal precedent, but well, that's not my point. My right. point well, is, this is where I was going My with point this. is, are they, are, they, are they at fault from a ethical standpoint? Yes. Sure. <laughs> But, but yes. ethics and law are two different things. This I know is, that. This is exactly but, my and point. And game designers have no morals at all. So we I'm, knew that. But, but we did establish their the idealists. Com- That's true. I'm just pointing out that the community, the community is right to be to feel betrayed. Sure. Because when that's, yeah, yeah. that's my point. And I'm not saying they should I'll, be sued. I'll totally, I'll totally see, see that. They're, they're not, I'm not yeah, saying they should yeah. be sued. I'm this, saying that this, they should feel betrayed. Okay, so and then we do. are on the same page, because this is where I was going with this the whole time, is that, yes, the community can dislike a thing, and it, it, Bioware can take a hit on their reputation for not living up to these promises, but... You know, would the would there would they be justified in suing them and getting a class action lawsuit to like refund everyone from Mass Effect Three? I think not, because you you bought the game, you played through the entire thing, didn't like the ending, and all of a sudden want a refund. That I think is not something that you can like legally say. That's not how it works. Yeah, no. The way that you no, well, vote on that right. is by when Mass Effect Four comes out, which and nobody buys will, it. You don't buy it. Actually, yeah. there are rumors that it might, and there are people. That are saying they're not going to buy it because of math. Good, theory. excellent. But yes, and I agree with you. It's, That's it's like how going, you cast your vote in a capitalist right. society. Well, it's like going to the movies. Same concept that uh-huh. we said before. Going to the movies, getting to the very end of the movie, and going, well, "I don't like the ending." Which Walking is, out and going, "Give me a refund which for is that movie." Exactly why I didn't you go can't to do the that. third M. Shyamalan Ding Dong movie <laughs> because uh, M. Night Shyamalan Ding Dong. Right, but yeah. what? What do you mean third movie? Like what, what was that? What, I stopped going the, to these movies a long eleva- time ago. The elevator one is that Elevator or no? Uh, what was it called? The de- was it just called Devil? I think it was, it was called just called Devil. Devil. I don't even know. I would watch a movie called Elevator. I'm going to go watch <laughs> right now. I, I'm there. See, I already wrote a better movie just with the title. <laughs> you did. I'm there, man. But, but Sell that's me my point. Movie. I went. I went and saw Sixth Sense. I really liked Sixth Sense. Then I went and saw uh, the, the Faith one about the aliens that, that came to the world uh, filled with oh, hydrochloric God. acid. So, I mean so. water. Yeah. Um, and and yeah. Yeah, it's, and, and I was disappointed in Signs, and so I didn't actually go see his third one in the theater, which was the one that was set in, in 1880, and it turned out it was really 1990, and it was like, <sighs> yeah, oh! Yeah, The Village, yeah. The Village, Ter- it, was yeah. Terrible. it was terrible, it was terrible. Well, and I, I saw it later, but that's the thing, is I didn't go to, I didn't waste my money in the theater to see it. Right. I waited until we could rent it and all watch it together and spend six bucks to collectively watch mm-hmm. it instead of 30 bucks mm-hmm. to all, you know what I'm saying? And this is how we cast our vote in America. None by getting on the internet and whining like a bunch of babies because the game we bought 
wasn't as fun as we thought well, it was. No, hold on though. I, I I disagree with the the whiny baby comment. I think that as a consumer and as someone that is you know which we all are, whether you're a professional reviewer or critic or mm-hmm. not, we all have the right to be critical of the media that we consume. I, so, I'm not talking about criticism. I am talking. I'm not talking about intelligent criticism. I am talking about getting on and being like, "This game sucks. I want my money back." Well, but can't you oh, say so this game sucks? Here's the difference. Can't you, you say you, this game sucks? Yes, you're, but you're can, totally can entitled you to why? say. Sure. People are citing why. I mean, that, you're, the you're, Mass you're Effect totally, totally, is the reason why. Like, the, he, I just explained why they he, won. Even whining is okay. And yeah, even saying I, I so want too. my money back is okay. But don't expect to actually get your money back. That's a good point. Well, and that also, a very good point. And also, I think that... I think that Companies should stand behind their products too. Oh yeah, and absolutely. should respect the community. Sure. And should also recognize, like for example, um, I, you know, I do think. Bi- I mean, to be honest with you, Bioware Bioware is a company that is dead to me and has been for a while now dead because, to me. well, <laughs> just I, I really do feel betrayed by um, their products. Mm. Uh, I feel that they moved. They've moved away from the sort of role playing experience that um, is why I fell in love with the company mm. initially. So you say talking you're, about specifically for Baldur's Gate. What you're saying is that now to you they are necroware. <laughs> yes, there you go. Um, no, but um, so so after the first Dragon Age and the first Mass Effect, games that I thought were <clears throat> good but not up to the level that I wanted from Bioware. Mm-hmm. But after that, the games they they released, in my opinion, were crap mm-hmm. because they were not what I wanted. I thought Dragon Age Two was garbage. Mm-hmm. I thought Mass Effect Two was just not the sort of game that I expected that I wanted like, mm-hmm. from that from that developer. Um, so, and I feel like they're more concerned with, and I've mentioned this before, the whole concept of um, you know, got to bang them all. That kind of relationship nonsense tends to be something that they all their marketing focuses on now, as opposed to, um, you know, a rich narrative with lots of choices, um, strong RPG mechanics, that kind of thing, mm-hmm. which is what they used to be known for. So, to me, the company itself is someone I don't even trust anyway. Sure, yeah, but and that's, I, that's that's totally fair, that's, right? Yeah, and, and but I can understand people in terms of Mass Effect Three that were expecting something, and and I disagree. I don't think they're just whiny baby saying they want their money back. They are specifically saying, "Here's why we're disappointed." And it's the whole ending, the ending discussion that I talked about, um, expecting something because this was a feature of the game that they expected to be carried through even into the ending. And when it wasn't, they felt disappointed. Now, if they people people just saying this game sucks, that's a little bit different. There are specific reasons that they're sucking. I could cite lots of examples from that specific series to, to show how it is not an, a required feature of every aspect of the game. I would say random planets that you drop down on, for example, would be a great example of that. Though that that's hours and hours of content that has no meaningful impact on your game. It's just for grinding and, sure, and, sure. and leveling up. And, you know, so, occasionally some interesting side stories. May, well, I, I'm not even talking about the side stories. I'm mm-hmm. just talking about the, let's pick a random planet and drop down. And well, be... even, even those are designed, though. Like, they're designed like little side missions. Well, that, yeah, they are. That was why I didn't like Mass, Mass Effect series, But the series, focus the is way. on players. Because it's very, yeah, it's very, it, it feels very empty. Yeah. And that was as soon as I got off the, the home world and it, and it blew out into, mm-hmm. now you make your own story. It's like, oh, okay, I, I get what yeah. kind of game this is. I'm, I'm not really that interested. Right. Uh, no, I'm, I'm with you on that. That. But like I said, I'm not actually a Mass Effect fan. What? I'm, I'm trying. I'm trying to champion the people that were disappointed because we don't have one here. Because you're not really, mm-hmm. you didn't really play through it, um, and Chris is okay with the ending. So I'm trying to play the other side. Sure. Okay. Well, the, I'm sticking up for those whiny let's, babies. <laughs> let's try to find the no man's land. Then at sure. what at what point? Where do we draw no, no the line? Where we say, um, where would you draw the line, Jim? Mm-hmm. Where, where we say um, we developers have a responsibility. To um, the, the the players, our our target audience specifically, because mm-hmm. I could make an argument that you're not Mass Effect's target audience, so they shouldn't care what you think. Oh no, no, and neither am I'm, I. I'm making, but I'm making the argument from that perspective. Arguments that I've read online extensively. Right. For, so I'm actually making that. So argument. let's move away so, from yeah. from that game specifically. But but my question is, where would you draw the line of the duty that we have? As designers, for our audience to make sure that that what we're creating for them is is different. In other words, uh, it has also been argued that No Man's Sky would have been fine if the price had been about a third of what it was, and they had openly stated that it was an alpha. Yeah. So, Dude, and, and that's something else that I have problem with too is the concept of selling someone an alpha. Um, I don't think you should be able to do it, quite okay. frankly. But um, as long as people are willing to buy it, then. Welcome to America. Well, I mean, it's you know, if I if I I could sell you like you know, 
trash or something. I mean, I don't think that I think that there is at a certain level you're just taking advantage of someone's stupidity. And sure, that, that I is mean, my opinion. You, you can argue if, that, but if someone's willing to buy again, it, welcome to America. Yeah, it's, like I like I said, that's why I'm against. That's why I'm against mm-hmm. selling alphas because yeah, you, you, you are taking it. it you are, well, you're taking advantage of. Idiots. I'm sorry. I have to mm-hmm. just to say that, but that is the truth. If you're bu- you're buying a product that is not complete, it's like if I go to a, you know, a car dealership and uh, you know I buy the frame of a car. It doesn't have an engine, mm-hmm. um, doesn't have wheels, but it's got the frame. And I buy the car. And I say, like, well, it's it's an, it's an alpha. I can just I can buy it. I'm gonna pay. I'm gonna buy it. Oh, I can pay a third of the price. Oh uh, no, it. alpha does imply functional. At least. Yeah, it does. So the car would run. It might just not have like the air conditioning and the radio. And... No, no, no. It's an <laughs> alpha. We that that'd be a beta. If a car is actually working, but it doesn't have extra features that it doesn't need. Kind of all my alphas have always been playable. Yeah. So. No, no, no. no. I'm, I, I agree with you on the playable part. At donkeykruger.com, just... all of <laughs> yeah, our yeah. But, but hold playable. on a second. Let's, really. let's, let's 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 go with this metaphor. Okay. So again, we're talking about an alpha, not a beta. These are two very different things. Mm-hmm. A beta is nearly released, it has a lot of the features, etc. Mm-hmm. An alpha, that's much farther back in the development cycle. So when you talk about things like, oh, it doesn't have AC, AC is an amenity. That's an amenity, and that's what you add after the beta, mm-hmm. is you're adding amenities to the game. You're adding the extra final polishing touches that would make it a full released title. That's the difference. But an alpha, that's, that's much farther okay, back well, in the let's, let's say this. Then. So we're like, saying, sure, a, so fun- a functional vehicle, but maybe it doesn't have a roof. Okay. Maybe it doesn't, you know what I'm saying? Okay, maybe so, yeah, it doesn't so, have doors. Yeah, so we'll adjust it. It we'll runs. Say we have the engine block. We have seats. We have a steering column. We have a frame. Yeah, yeah. Nothing else has been put on yet. Nevertheless, it's still a driving, workable car. Probably not street legal. <laughs> exactly. That's what I'm saying. No, no, no. No, exactly. It's not street legal. Yeah. That's, that's, and, and also, it's extremely dangerous. Mm-hmm. And also, it's like it's it's border. It's like barely even what you would consider a car. Mm-hmm. It like barely passes that check where you're like, I guess it's a car. Mm-hmm. That's kind of what an alpha is. I guess it's a game. <laughs> that's where you are. You're at the the alpha is that point, the first point that you reach where you go, well, it kind of works. There's an mm-hmm. that's unwritten. The alpha assumption, a yeah. covenant, if you will, with your players, which is, we know this is alpha, and we know it's going to change. Help us develop it. Help us fix it. Help us test it. You are essentially paying to be a tester when you download an alpha. And, and, and once again, I, I completely, I think that that, that entire mo- that business model, that entire business model is flawed from the start. Okay, well, wh- whether you think it is or isn't is irrelevant mm. because people do it. Right. And, and as the someone, question, yeah. it's secondary to the question, which is um, how, how, should, how much should you be held accountable to making your audience happy? Well, in that case, when you, if you're talking about someone paying for an alpha when now they're, they're basically testing your game and they're, giving you, they're basically the ones that are helping you develop the game, mm-hmm. That's a different situation from someone releasing a complete product. Because I agree. at that point, yeah. now now you are obligated to to they're they're essentially your investors. Essentially. Yeah, yeah they are your yeah. investors. And, and that's that's you know, that's as someone who's bought several alphas and pre releases, right. I sort of see it that way. I see it as, hey, this is something I'm interested in. I'm gonna go ahead and put down a very small amount of money so that I can get the full copy when it comes out. And in the meantime I get to try out this thing that I think sounds really cool. Right. But at that point you are you are not purchasing a complete yeah. product. And that, that, you are that, an yes. investor. That's exactly right. And they have a much bigger obligation mm. at and that, that point mm. to follow what you want them to do. If they are like they need to be listening to that community. I'm not saying obviously that there's a lot of investors. You can't listen to everyone mm-hmm. because they might have completely different ideas. But if the consensus among among investors is a certain direction, mm-hmm. you are obligated to follow that. You are, you no longer have complete control over what your game is going to be. Mm-hmm. You've lost it by asking for this help. You've lost by creative this, control. Correct. Yeah. You've lost it. Now, now, you still have... I'm not going to say you can't do anything. No, you have creative you, oversight. Mm-hmm. Exactly. That's And it's the same thing. If, if you're an independent filmmaker and you're making a film um, and you have no um, you know, investors, no, no, there's no producer that's overseeing it that's like saying, I'm going to help fund this project... Um, you can do whatever you want, but once you get that producer on board, and they start saying, mm, "I don't know if I like this. Let's let's change this character like this because it'll 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 do better with audiences." Well, guess what? You have to listen to this voice now. You do not have full creative control over your over that your idea, and that is what happens when you sell an alpha. So if you look at if if you do want to go into the alpha alpha argument, that's what that's what you've become as an investor, and in that sense, um, you have an even greater obligation. See, I, I like that argument a lot better than your original argument about, you know, story endings having to make people happy. But uh, oh, I, 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 again, I don't think they should make you happy. And I so the story should come full circle. And I think I think bit. we have here a distinction between the responsibilities of an artist to produce a work that one like because you don't want, you don't want them to like necessarily have to give up their artistic integrity to make the audience happy. Yeah, but, but you, you do want again, to give ha- them happy is the wrong word. Yeah. satisfied. Satisfied. That's a very very different because for example, Braveheart does not have a happy ending, mm-hmm. but it is a sat- it is a satisfying story. 
Okay, yeah. Very big difference. We want to we want to feel like the story is comes to completion. You see, then you get striking into some some tricky territory though, where someone like one group of people might think that the story was satisfying, while others don't, and then that's where you get into artistic. Uh, right, of course. There, and, there's subjectivity. Yeah. I'm not yeah. saying any there's Quentin not. Tarantino film. Right. <laughs> I'm just I'm, I'm not saying there's not subjectivity. Yeah. It's just I just want to move away from the term happy sure. because happy suggests. Mm. Well, a happy ending. Yeah. There's plenty of endings sure, that sure. are not happy. And I guess when I was saying happy, I did mean satisfying. Right. Like, I, I am happy with so my purchase. Yeah. 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 Um, but there's a difference between kind of like artistic integrity and wanting to deliver, you know, a good product that is like true to yourself and something that you think the audience will enjoy and hopefully they do enjoy. Right. And then the more like sort of legal, like consumer, like I have bought a thing and I'm returning it on the basis that it does not live up to my expectations. Um, and I think that there are some cases where, like, yes, like, No Man's Sky is a case where I think that they had a lot of promises that weren't fulfilled. And, like, personally, I'm not one who's going to try to go get a refund for it because I don't care that much. You should. Um, but even that being said, if I wanted to, I think I would feel more justified in wanting to pursue that. Right. With something like Mass Effect, even if I didn't like it, I don't think I would, like, feel justified in wanting a refund because – I bought the game, I played it for 30 hours, mm-hmm. and just because I didn't like the ending doesn't mean that I didn't play the game for yeah, 30 no hours. Right. No, and I, and I agree with that statement, too. Mm-hmm. I don't think that people... I don't think that in that in that instance there is a, I didn't like the ending, therefore I should get a refund on, on the game itself. That, to me, is, mm-hmm. is absurd. Yeah. I think that it's more of a... Throughout the game, there are these features that, that are... Are features that are are present throughout the game itself, mm-hmm. and that's where, that's why you bought the game, and therefore you deserve a refund. Which I think you could make that argument mm-hmm. for No Man's Sky. Yeah. In, in in Mass Effect, it only affects the ending, so you've already played the game, even if you mm-hmm. don't like the ending. Mm-hmm. Um, another game, hell, uh, Neverwinter Nights Two was a game that I enjoyed. Um, wasn't the best. Um, but, I mean, it was a game that I enjoyed as an RPG, but the ending is notorious for being one of the worst game endings of all time. <laughs> I hated it. It's, liter- it's literally, your party beats the big bad. Instead of having an actual ending, there's, like, a slideshow. And, and as you, you see your characters, like, on this, in this ravine, it's like, oh, they, they walk out from the, the big bad's lair, without getting too specific. Um, oh, and then uh, rocks fall from the sky and crush the party and they die. The end. Rocks fall, everyone dies. <laughs> not even kidding. I'm not even kidding. That is the actual Neverwinter Nights <laughs> 2 ending. Excellent. And it is... It's so shockingly bad that you can't even get that pissed at it because you're just like, what? Uh, it just sounds like a really bad GM. Yeah, it just I, exactly. It's <laughs> like the GM. GM the, DM, yeah, yeah. The, D, the DM's like, well, you know what? I just want this. I just want this game to be over. Okay, uh, rocks, fall, rocks fall and crush you guys. You're all dead. <laughs> Do you know how yeah. long I planned that encounter for? You guys just beat my boss. <laughs> <laughs> rocks. Oh, rocks <laughs> And that's an extremely long Rage game. Yeah. Yeah, yeah. So to, to use that example, yeah, but yeah. at the same time, you spend all this time in the game itself. So mm-hmm. even though you're disappointed in the ending, mm-hmm. you still enjoyed the ride. Yeah. So you can't – there's no reason to get a refund there. Mm-hmm. Um, but I agree with you. I think there's that extra um, – to add the third level um, to the two examples that you gave, the two different mm-hmm. um, distinctions. There is that distinction that I think that we've, we've come across with these alphas. And by the way, Kickstarter is part of that too. When you, when you kickstart a game, you are an investor. Mm-hmm. You That's are true. now an investor in this game. And you have some, some control and some influence over how – the influence is probably a better word than control. Mm-hmm. Um, but you do have influence over, over the direction that that project is going to take. And I think that – there is this, um, I think, um, among people that are kick, trying to get games kickstarted and, and, are, and are part of that, and that includes Hello Games and, and a bunch of people that, that we know, that, that you know, I personally know and you personally know and mm-hmm. we all know, um, that, are, that are smaller studios that are trying to get, they, that either have gotten games kickstarted or are trying to get games kickstarted. Um, some of them don't quite recognize that once you put yourself out there on something like Kickstarter and people are investing in your project, um, they are investing in you, they're investing in what you've promised but also they have expectations of how that project is going to how the final version will be mm. you don't know you mean you may know exactly what you want at the end but you probably haven't explained literally the minutiae of everything that's going to happen inside your kickstarter pitch because why would you yeah um so they're investing in what they know and mm-hmm. once they start investing they're going to start trying to influence the project along the lines of what they want. And you kind of have to listen to them because you are not selling them a product. You are asking, give me money up front before we're done so that we can make this. Mm -hmm. There's also the understanding, though, that... When you're an investor in something, there's also a chance that something can fail. Of course. Mm -hmm. Of course. No, no, I agree with that. Mm -hmm. But but failure and 
I'm not releasing... sure the community does though. Well, I, that's another problem. I, I agree with that they don't they don't necessarily realize. Uh, sometimes the, these this, don't work. this isn't even pre ordering. This is you are literally making an investment mm-hmm. that means that it could just like the the project could crash mm-hmm. and that you never get anything it, for it. It goes beyond the alpha the example that you were talking about too, because mm-hmm. with the alpha. Um, at least they, they've put enough work into it that you can see this project will probably finish at some point. Mm-hmm. Just like when I was following the, the Metroid 2 um, remake, um, which ended up being a fantastic game. But he had a playable demo probably about two or three years before he actually had released the final product. Mm-hmm. So he had um, essentially an alpha version, an, early, an earlier alpha version that was... Um, that we could play and we could kind of see, okay, what what was there, what what could he do, that kind of thing, mm-hmm. far in advance from what you know was actually out, and that gives you an idea about what the final project might be, our product might be, but it also gives you, it alleviates that worry of will this actually come out? Mm-hmm. The answer is well, probably. I mean, if he's gone this far, mm-hmm. and that's probably what you're noticing with these alphas that that you might be interested in. Mm-hmm. Um, you're expecting that your expectation for that coming out. I'm assuming is higher than if you just invest in a Kickstarter because you've actually seen something that's been produced. Mm-hmm. A Kickstarter, especially when No Man's Sky first started, which is why I was so against people giving money to it initially and warning people, because the whole thing had red flags up the wazoo, mm-hmm. uh, the sort of things they were promising, and then like just basically showing a little video. They had literally nothing else. They had no engine built or anything. Yeah. Um, and the promises that they that they had were, uh, uh, frankly, absurd, and the sort of things that I was surprised people in the game community were actually buying into because it was things that didn't make any sense. Well, to be frank, for a small studio, uh, players don't necessarily know or understand what is doable and yeah. what is not. We've been sold the line as players. We've been sold the line that anything is possible in a video game. Yeah, everything is doable. If you can imagine it, you can make the computer do it. And that's not really true. You need, no, it's not you true need at incredibly all. brilliant designers to to create these systems. Now they had a really neat angle, which was. Uh, that they were going to put in stuff that was modeled after the universe. And, I, and I've seen some really great articles about how it was that they, they started their design from basically the math of the universe. Um, you, by the stuff that's in the, you know, in the science textbooks, basically, they, that's what they started with is their variables. And then, as I understand it, they had things that were in there, like rotation of planets and orbits and things like that, that they were told to take out by their producers. And I predict... If you'll indulge me in a little bit of reckless speculation, if it ever does come out, um, that we're going to discover that um, perhaps the blame is not to be put on the developers themselves, but on the producers, as you were saying, because the producers have creative control. They take the risk. They want the money. And in this case, I really think and wonder if maybe there was a game a little bit more like what we expected there to be um, that just never got... Well, I, I I don't, maybe to an extent, I don't think that they could have pulled off a lot of the things they said that they wanted to do anyway. Like, that's, mm-hmm. because they were simply not a big enough studio to do so. They didn't, they didn't have the resources to do no, so. No, I think what so. they needed was two or three more years, and uh, the producer said, no, you're launching now, gamers are stupid, go. I really do think that's what happened. Uh, I think that, that we may be, uh, and by we I mean us, all us players, all us gamers, that we may have um, overreacted a little bit without the correct information. This is my own personal reckless speculation. Mm-hmm. I think the intent was good. I don't think that there was a, a grand um, uh, s- scheme at play here. I, I don't think that we were manipulated or uh, or lied mm-hmm. to in the sense that, oh, I've been telling them this, this stuff, and then I'm going to give them garbage, and they're never no- going to know because they're dumb. No, I don't think the devs meant that. So, so I really think they believed everything they were saying. I'm going to have to disagree with you. I, I know. actually, I know most people probably. Will. I actually do think that de- I think the devs intentionally they looked at what what the sort of things were coming through on Kickstarter. Mm-hmm. They create they put together a trailer that was intended to fool people into thinking that they could actually do this because it, it came across that way to me when I first saw it. It raised all it rose all these red flags. Mm-hmm. I, I saw it. I immediately thought these people are, are are trying to sucker sucker people that don't quite understand what it takes to put this sort of game together into giving them all this money so that they can build a game that they can never possibly build. Yeah. Um, I really do think that they were trying to manipulate people. I think that they, they knew uh, they're smart enough to see what um, sort of games were going through, like what sort of games triggered um, the most excitement, I guess you mm-hmm. could say, hype in the gamer community. And they basically tried to push all those buttons intentionally. And sure, maybe they, they attempted to build 
something. I'm not saying they didn't try they didn't try to put out a product, but I think that they were quite intentional in trying to push all those buttons. I think everything to make you money. said is accurate except the malice and intent to deceive. I really think they believed naively perhaps, but I believe that, that, that they really thought they could do it. Um, so then they're stupid. I've seen so it. the difference I've is you they think may just be ignorant. you think that they're dumb and I think that they're inte- like I think malicious. they're idealistic um, and possibly naive. Right. So dumb. Um, yeah. Well, you know, whatever. <laughs> but the the point is I don't think they were liars. I don't think they were intentionally um uh, doing a con job. And I think that there's a great and huge embarrassment on their part now that they realize what they've done uh, and basically destroyed their hopes and dreams of ever being able to work in the community again. Uh, and I think that's why they're on the run right now. I think that I think that's what's happening. I think that's the mm. biggest evidence of all. Well, I think either way, whether it's uh, naivete or it's malicious, I think that they kind of deserve whatever they get. Um, if you are right, I agree. If I am right, I genuinely feel sorry for them, and I hope they go after the producers. Well, but the producers had nothing to do with that initial video that I'm talking about, though. Like, that part that we were talking about, specifically how they approached their Kickstarter campaign before mm-hmm. the producers came in, that falls into the And what I'm saying argument. is I think that the producers... No, but I, I suspect but there was on. an you, argument you give around them, it. You table. give them two years, you give them five years, they're never going to be able to get... To, that, to, to their promises. That's not going to happen. I, I, dis, I disagree, actually. I, I think that they might have been able to get close enough and over that threshold of uh, what we've all been talking about that that we wouldn't feel like they had lied to us in between. I think also it's quite possible they could have achieved what they were wanting to do with their procedural generation and still had a really boring, like, not fun That's delay. true, yeah. Too, yeah. Uh, yeah. And that, I, so. I think it was always going to be that experience because of their... Um, their goal of procedural generation, yep. like focusing so much on it, it was all it was always going to disappoint, and that falls back into the to, to the naivete argument mm-hmm. is that they didn't really quite understand what they were doing from the get go. Yeah, and to a certain extent, I agree with you, but I do think that they were in trying to push those buttons to get extra money. I think to me that that comes across as malicious. I think that was a producer decision, but this yeah. was before the producers were involved. The Kickstarter was before the producers. Yeah, but their decision of when to release was the producers. Right, but the them putting they were the ones that put together that video. Yeah, but that video, I believe they, whether naively or not, genuinely believe they could produce that. I think the problem is I don't think we're ever going to know because yeah, I, I don't think there's totally there's a way for us to unless there's some sort of like I don't even know like some sort of smoking gun document out there that can somehow prove the timetable of when all this stuff went down and what their yeah, original intent would, would be. Surprise me a bit. It would because finding that and then authenticating it would be pretty difficult. Mm. Uh, I, I don't think we're ever going to know the full story, maybe unfortunately. Um, unless there's like maybe one of the people involved, um, you know, breaks the silence, comes out, and has like um, a tell all or something like that. I don't know. <laughs> oh, see, that sounds great. That could be interesting. And if, if you do and you're listening, uh, contact us. We will put you on the show. Sure. So, yeah, I mean, like, I'd, I'd be interested to hear from our audience, you know, in comments and that sort of thing, what they, you know, kind of going back to the, the, the discussion that we've been having of what, what is the developer responsible for, you know, as, as far as their relationship to the consumers? Um, because there's kind of like, you know, as we've established, two different discussions to be had between responsible as far as artistry and responsible as far as, you know, product development. Um, and that's that's always kind of been like a, weird, a little bit of a weird line as far as consumer entertainment goes. And games are an interesting case because they are so big and they're so interactive, um, you know, as opposed to like books and movies and stuff like that. I mean, maybe these discussions happen and they probably still do happen to an extent um, today, um, you know, but maybe in their in their early days, you know, was there more of a discussion about like I'm entitled to um, a refund for, you know, not liking content or feeling like a book didn't live up to expectations or something like that. Mm-hmm. Um, so, I mean, you know, let us know in the comments what you think of all this. And uh, I think that definitely happens. Like you look at mm-hmm. stuff like um, really big properties. Again, I'm not a Harry Potter fan, but mm-hmm. there there's certainly been some complaints about, uh, you know, certain character deaths or, or endings and certain and. For the actual entire series, mm-hmm. I know people yeah, have complained. But did they about demand it. their money back? I'm sure. I guarantee you, some people did. Yeah, but as a community, are they demanding their money back? Well, can you, as a community, were people demanding their money back for Mass Effect Three? Not really. I mean, there were certainly some some voices, very vocal voices, that but were. But as a community, 
the vocal voices, if you will, the, the, the leaders in the community from at least three sources are demanding their full money back for No Man's Sky. Yes, but in that case, we all agree there's a case, there's there's actually reason mm. behind it. I was talking about Mass Effect 3. Mm. In No Man's Sky, there's a reason that there there's actual good reasons why they, they should demand their money back. Well, reason, but maybe not legal mm. reason. And so here we have our, our, our platforms for discussion. And yeah. uh, if everyone wants to chime in, and we'll see kind of where this discussion goes. I think, though, that kind of as a, as a podcast, we hosts are kind of more or less on the same page, that there is indeed the difference between um, being satisfied with, say, the story versus not receiving the features you were promised. And that's kind of where a, lot, a big distinction lies. Yep. I think probably the greatest case for any I want my money back regarding a video game has to do with the mechanics. Yes, I agree. Well, thank you everyone for joining us for episode number 80 of the Backward-Compatible.com podcast, our discussion on the developer's responsibilities to the consumer. I'm Chris. I'm Jim. And I'm Doc. And we'll see you next time. We want to join your discussion because dialogue makes everyone better. Want to hear our thoughts on a particular game or topic? Get in touch with us on Facebook, Twitter, SoundCloud, YouTube, or at our website, backward-compatible.com. And we might feature your question on a future episode of the podcast. Thanks for listening. Until next time, stay compatible. Backward Compatible. You were waiting for a witty comeback and they didn't have one. <laughs> You're just looking at me. I'm, what? I was. I was waiting for what? it. You let me down. <laughs> well, sorry, I had to catch a retata between his legs. <laughs> yeah. um, not sure how that got down. I'm going to name him Lo Wang. <laughs> <laughs> you should. <laughs>